Hello and welcome to the Suburban Wasteland, with me, Echo Gecko. In this episode and the next, we are covering the environmental consequences of mass suburbanization, ranging from carbon emissions to habitat destruction, energy efficiency, biodiversity, and chemical pollution. To get a real grasp on the environmental impact of the city and the suburb, we first have to cover a brief modern history of urban life and the environment. Ironically, the original development of modern suburbs in the 19th century was a pro-health and pro-environment measure. Throughout history, but especially during the Industrial Revolution, cities were really filthy places. Living conditions declined enough that populations became visibly shorter in both the US and UK, while pollution got so bad that English moths actually evolved from having light to very dark pigmentation over just a few decades to better hide in the soot-coated industrial landscape, a process known as industrial melanism. So long as heavy industry was so heavily concentrated, not to mention the untreated sewage and garbage from millions of people, there was going to be a desire to suburbanize into the cleaner, greener, and healthier areas outside of cities. By the late 19th century, English utopians were planning garden cities on the outskirts of English industrial centers, which were lower-density peripheral towns with plenty of trees and greenery meant to provide residents with the benefits of urban life without the Dickensian conditions. A few of these garden cities were actually built, especially around London, and their circular design remains an inspiration for many speculative city plans today. Given the relatively recent industrial legacy of US cities, Many Americans to this day associate the city with a dirty, dangerous atmosphere, and the suburbs with idyllic, pseudo-rural pastoral life. In the US especially, this narrative is tinged with more than a bit of racism, given the large black populations in many American cities compared to the relatively segregated suburbs. But the clean suburb and the polluting city are surprisingly also total myths from a purely environmental perspective. By nearly every metric, suburbs are increasingly the most polluting and most unhealthy urban configuration out there. Let's talk about why that is. In this first part, we're tackling the elephant in the room, carbon emissions. In this first part, we're tackling the single biggest issue, carbon dioxide emissions. Surprisingly, suburbs seem to be by far the worst offenders when it comes to greenhouse gases worse than both urban and rural areas. One comprehensive study of New Jersey settlement patterns found that, quote, per capita carbon dioxide emissions vary widely, following an inverted U-shape, with post-war suburbs riding the pinnacle, unquote, when compared to population density. Now, according to the EPA, which surprisingly still has a greenhouse gases section on its website, about 30% of US emissions come from transportation, another 30% come from electrical generation, only 22% come from industrial activity, and the rest come from agricultural and miscellaneous sources. The emissions from transport are dominated by emissions from private, automotive transport. That is to say, cars. And as I discussed in my last video, American suburbs make it impossible to walk, bike, take transit, or really get around much at all without a car. In fact, one study found that over a quarter of all American car trips are less than a mile long, and 41% of trips were less than 2 miles in length. These are distances that are easily covered by foot or bicycle if you have the infrastructure for it. In many newer suburbs, the problem actually seems to be getting worse. Another study focusing on Montgomery County, a large and growing suburban region to the north of Philadelphia, found that between 1990 and 2003, total vehicle miles traveled and associated emissions increased twice as fast as the population. So not only were more people moving to car-centric suburbia, but its residents were driving even more than before. You only have to look at the sprawling parking lots in front of suburban strip malls and office parks to realize just how entrenched car use is in American suburbs. That study of New Jersey concluded that, quote, only exceptionally high densities coupled with transit access and walkable destinations yield dramatic reductions in per capita emissions, unquote. Even if you get people to drive less with the car they have, just having that car is pretty bad for the environment. It turns out that producing a car creates as much carbon dioxide as driving it. Electric cars probably won't save us either. Even if they get their electricity from a green source, an unlikely state given America's sluggish move away from fossil fuels, 
just manufacturing the batteries could be more polluting than driving a gasoline car. Actually, let's talk about those sprawling parking lots and developments. The thing about cities is that by definition, they pack a lot of people into a fairly small space compared to their suburban outgrowths. This means that to house a given number of people in a suburb, you need to chop down a lot more trees, clear a lot more wetlands, and generally build over a lot more wilderness than you would to put them in a city. A 2012 study, which looked at the US east of the Mississippi, found that between 1992 and 2001, all urban areas combined only grew by about 30 square kilometers, while suburban sprawl grew by over 3,000 square kilometers. And since plants grow by absorbing and storing carbon dioxide from the air, bulldozing over them not only releases all the carbon those plants stored, but prevents that land from absorbing carbon in the future. In fact, that 2012 study found that as exurban land turned into suburbs, it absorbed 152 fewer grams of CO2 per square meter per year. Do some basic math, and this comes out to about 150,000 kilograms of carbon per year per square kilometer just from reduced vegetation. The study of Montgomery County notes that, quote, development claimed almost 25% of the county's forest land over the last 15 years, unquote. While the New Jersey study highlights that, quote, New Jersey's largest land use growth is in the urban category, which also includes suburbs, mostly at the expense of agricultural land, forested land, and wetlands." Unquote. Now, some suburbanites might point out that suburbs must surely be environmentally friendly. After all, just look at all the greenery. Well, this is only partially true. First of all, the suburbs might not actually have that much green cover compared to cities. The 2012 study of American land east of the Mississippi used satellite imagery to estimate coverage and type of greenery and found that by 2001, suburbs had a higher proportion of built-up land, and hence less greenery per area, than urban areas. So not only are suburbs quite bad at absorbing carbon dioxide in general, but newer suburbs are actually getting worse at it, maybe even worse than our cities. After all, cities aren't coded in massive parking lots at least anymore, and some have even done a good job of rehabilitating nature within them. Everybody knows about Central Park in New York, but parks like St. Paul's 26-mile-long Mississippi River waterfront, or Chicago's 19-mile-long Lakefront Trail, are even better examples. Fortunately, most of our cities aren't as gray as Manhattan. But this can still be a bit counterintuitive, since anybody can hop on Google Maps and clearly see that, for example, Chicago proper is much more gray than the surrounding suburbs, right? This is true for the central business district, but if we zoom into the residential neighborhoods of the city, we can see that while buildings packed close together give the land a gray appearance from a distance, up close there are actually a lot of trees, many more than modern suburban streets. Additionally, a 2017 report by the nonprofit Trust for Public Land found that in most dense American cities, between 10 and 20% of all land area was parkland. This is a much higher proportion than low density American cities, which typically only have 3 to 7% of land set aside for parks. Furthermore, most suburban green space is composed of lawns. In fact, across the entire US, Turf grass takes up 32 million acres, larger than the state of Ohio. According to a 2015 study, this is three times larger than the space used for any other irrigated crop in America. Unfortunately, compared to forest or wetland, suburban lawns aren't very good at absorbing carbon. That 2012 study notes that forest, for example, absorbs about 50% more carbon dioxide per square meter than grass lawns. Furthermore, Regular lawn mowing generates a significant, if relatively small, amount of carbon dioxide, estimated by one study to be about 14 grams of carbon per square meter per year. While small, this amount was large enough to quote, eventually outweigh the carbon storage potential of turf grasses, transforming home lawns from a carbon sink to a carbon source, unquote. Oh, and did I mention that Americans spend $40 billion on lawn care a year, 
as much as the US government's entire foreign aid budget? That sounds efficient. But so far, we've missed the biggest issue within the biggest issue. Transportation is only 30% of US emissions, and deforestation is also relatively minor compared to the biggest consumer of energy, climate control, or the heating and cooling of buildings. I couldn't find any specific American numbers, but one study of Australia suggests that, quote, heating and cooling presently accounts for 40.7% of national energy consumption, unquote. The US is more temperate, but 12% of emissions are generated directly by residential and commercial use, while nearly half of home electricity is used for heating or cooling, in a nation where the large majority of electricity is still generated by burning fossil fuels. Heating and cooling buildings seems to be the source of the plurality of our emissions, with suburbs being a major contributor. As one American study puts it, quote, large units in lower density areas, e.g. single-family detached units that are also the most popular type, create the most emissions in both their construction and operation." Unquote. Single houses are really inefficient at keeping heat in or out, as infrared images of these homes clearly show. And it's been getting worse as we've been building McMansions and other monstrosities in our suburbs. One study in Los Angeles found that since 1990, quote, a large fraction of the energy savings that would have been expected from recent residential energy efficiency improvements were likely lost as a result of parallel growth in the sheer size of new homes." Unquote. Homes have grown so massive that no amount of advances in efficiency or insulation have actually cut down on their total energy use. In contrast, urban units tend to be much smaller, both because of physical space constraints and also because cities are filled with public amenities so city dwellers don't need massive backyards, or multiple fridges, or pantries, or triple garages, when they have plenty of parks, groceries, and transit options within walking distance. In addition, homes in urban settings are often a part of large buildings like apartment blocks, and so each unit is only exposed to the sun and wind on one or two sides, instead of all four like with a detached home. To put it somewhat technically, Building volume is a cubic function, while building surface area is a square function. So as a building gets larger, the volume grows faster than the outside surface exposed to the climate. Therefore, bigger buildings generally need less energy per cubic foot of internal space to heat or cool them, since heat or cold have a harder time escaping or getting in. The US Energy Information Administration has consistently shown that single-family detached units use up to twice as much energy per household compared to multi-unit buildings, though as far as I can tell, these numbers don't control for demographics. In fact, urban dwellers across the board emit much less CO2 than their suburban counterparts. A 2010 study, which compared total household carbon emissions between cities and suburbs in dozens of American metropolitan areas, found that in all but two cities, urbanites spew out less, in some cases much less, carbon dioxide than their suburban neighbors. New York saw the biggest difference, with over six tons less of carbon dioxide per household per year. In general, city livers produced several tons less than suburban folks in the same region. The two exceptions, Los Angeles and Detroit, actually prove the rule. Both are infamously low-density cities whose neighborhoods look more like suburbs than an urban core. Now to be fair, some studies have found that urban residents generate more CO2 than suburban people, such as this study from Finland, which found that per capita emissions rise by some 20% in central Helsinki when accounting for consumption, or the emissions generated to produce what we buy. However, in all these cases, the authors actually find that this is due to greater wealth in urban downtowns. Quote, the differences in the carbon consumption between the two areas are, according to the model used, mainly due to the higher standard of living and consequent higher consumption in the downtown area. Unquote. Control for income, and cities once again become the superior choice. In fact, that 2010 study did control for income, along with family size, and still found that cities outperformed their suburbs almost across the board. The results can best be seen in this visualization, based on data from a 2013 paper, which calculated average per capita emissions by zip code across the entire United States. I've linked to an interactive version in the description, but the most obvious lesson is apparent from even a quick glance. Let's look at some major metropolitan areas. 
In all these cases, emissions are low in the city proper and explode in the suburbs before gradually fading down in the countryside. The lesson here is that city and country have to unite to overthrow their suburban oppressors and establish a green urbanist utopia with agricultural elements as described by Murray Bookchin in his masterful synthesis of Unfortunately, the Australia study noted that, quote, new developments of large homes on the urban fringe account for a significant portion of new builds, unquote, something familiar to any American. And while it's tempting to say that simply making our cars electric and making electricity green would solve nearly all the problems covered here today, the experts aren't so sure. A 2007 study looking at Switzerland concluded that ambitious climate goals could likely only be achieved through reductions in energy consumption rather than just changing where we get our energy in the first place. Gasoline or carbon taxes may not be enough either. While they may convince people to urbanize in the long run, in the short run, people are often held down by their jobs and their families. In a moment where the poor are increasingly being priced out of cities and forced into the suburbs, such policies in isolation could be terribly regressive. There are sources of hope and positive change, however, models that I will cover in the second video on this topic, along with discussion of a host of non-carbon environmental suburban concerns. Just remember, we're not doomed yet.